Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we are back for yet another episode, and uh, I'm actually here with a new friend of mine, Ali Ciarto. Ali, thank you so much for making time for the Boca Podcast today. Thanks for having me, Nathan. And we we actually, we were chatting about this before we hit the record button. I kind of like to break the fourth wall here, and, and you are actually a podcast host yourself, correct? I am. I have a podcast called Photo Field Notes. So I also share a lot of just the things that I've learned over the years as a wedding and portrait photographer is over there. And we'll make sure to link to that in the the show notes too, for those listening in. I I know that it can be tough at times to find a podcast, not only that is actually informative, like you actually walk away with something beneficial that you can go apply to your life, but also somebody you feel like you can connect with. And I already like your podcast voice and persona, Ali, so I think this is (laughs) going to be a good fit today too. But let's just jump right in. And you know, one of the first things that I normally ask our guests has to do with time management, because uh, the reality is, first of all, we, we are all kind of crunched for time as business owners. Uh, and the Boca podcast and ultimately Photographers Edit, these brands are about time. We want to give photographers time back. And so I'm curious if there's something that you do in your day-to-day workflow, your week-to-week workflow that has enabled you to be able to save a bit of time so that you can give that. I mean, you can have that for yourself. You can give that to your family or maybe even invest in things that actually move your business forward. Yes. I love this question. And actually it's kind of ironic because you use a calendar app and that's my first thing. But what I did was when you put, you gave me your calendar app to schedule this interview and I made a mistake and I scheduled it on a Wednesday, which is actually a day that I normally take off with my three-year-old daughter. Oh, no way. (laughs) So calendar app being number one only works if you actually pay attention to your calendar. So Luckily, she's really good at playing by herself. So she's playing in the other room. So hopefully she won't come in and eat anything. Oh, man, I feel terrible now. No, it was my fault. It's totally fine. She's she loves to play by herself. So I love my calendar app because what I do is I have it set up to both have my my clients can book sessions. I basically sit down at the beginning of the year and I say, okay, these are all of the dates that I'm willing to take photo sessions. And I'm going to take these days off because I don't want to work every single day. And I look up the sunset so I can say, okay, somebody can actually go in and book themselves based on the best time when the sun sets. So that basically I can just send them a link and it's all taken care of instead of that whole back and forth where you're like, oh, what about this, this, this? And I used to do that. And I do think even with wedding potential wedding clients, I would send them three dates to meet for that first meeting. And it was just a lot of extra work. So I found the calendar app is amazing for saving some time. And the one we're actually talking about, um, at least the one that that I sent to you that I use is called Calendly. And it really does help say, I I can only imagine, and I've only used it for maybe uh, like a year and a half, maybe two years at the most now. But the amount of time that I've saved getting rid of that just annoying instant messenger style back and forth via email, trying to schedule appointments has just been, uh, it's just been amazing to say the least. Yes. Yeah. I use schedule once, which is very similar Okay, and it starts out at like five bucks a month. It's like having a personal assistant. It's amazing and so worth it. And then I pay, I think like 20 bucks a month to have multiple options for meetings and sessions and things like that. So that's awesome. But yeah, so basically I really try to look at my calendar and be smart about it most days, not today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and say, you know, these are the days that I'm going to work. I'm not going to try to work in the evenings. I So I also get help where I need it, like childcare, daycare. That's huge for me. I know a lot of people don't necessarily have that option or use that option, but that is like how I stay sane is getting help and batch content creation. So I sit down and I create stuff all at once. I like get my brain in the zone and I go and then just generally automating everything that I can so that I'm not recreating the wheel every single time. I love automation. It's my favorite thing. Yeah, you know, scheduling um, or ultimately, uh, well, a couple of things we've talked about now, or you've you've mentioned scheduling one uh, and taking advantage of something that you just alluded to, which is automation, right? We're using an app like Schedule Once or Calendly 
to automate this back and forth, this process of communication in order to be able to schedule an event. But automation plays a significant role in saving time. This is something that we've talked about on the podcast that I've talked about in presentations in the past. Um, that is a significant time saver. The other one that you also mentioned uh, that we also talk about in the podcast quite a bit is this notion of delegation, right? W- whether you're delegating uh, childcare in some cases, which can be really, really helpful. And I think, you know, maybe a lot of parents, and, and I've and in some ways done this in the past as well, kind of beat themselves up for handing their kid over to someone for, you know, a segment of time so that you can focus on work or otherwise. And I, I don't really think that there is any need for for guilt in that realm. I mean, if you look at just our cultural history as, as human beings, um, that the idea of relying on a community of people in order to function in life is actually quite a natural and normal thing. So this idea that we that we would rely on family or friends occasionally to watch our kids, I think, can actually be really, really healthy. Yeah, and I think that the more the I. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, so I've been at this long enough to get past most of the guilt, but I'll still find myself thinking, oh my gosh, I'm picking up Arden, my three-year-old at like at 5.30 one day, and then I'll get there and she'll be playing outside and she'll be like, mommy, why did you come get me when I was playing outside? I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> or we did a trip last year. We took, I took six, six weeks off, completely off in the winter. I live in Michigan, so it's really cold. So we went to Florida for six weeks. And by the end of it, those girls were so ready to get back to their friends at school. And they're just like their normal routines of going to school and doing their things and having their friends. They were so tired of me. I am not as exciting as a five-year-old or a three-year-old. So (laughs) there should be no guilt there. (laughs) Well, and there is something to be said too, I think, for the independence that our children can learn through this process of not being with us all the time, right? I mean, we, we can't yeah. put enough importance on the significance of our connection, our relationship with our kids and having that focused quality personal time with them. But then the flip side of that is an opportunity for them to learn how to engage with other kids, their own age, socially, to be in different environments on a relatively regular basis, I think encourages flexibility, um, the, the understanding of what it means to kind of go with the flow and and minimizing the possibility of social anxiety, which is a topic that comes up a lot these days. I think there, there's a lot of potential, actually, and letting our kids be with somebody else occasionally. So um, it, we'll, we'll leave that alone for now. I know it's a massive topic, but I, I yeah. like that you point out the significance of delegation um, and yeah. the significance of automation here. And as maybe in some ways, as simple as these ideas are, they cannot be really reiterated or stressed enough. For those listening in, if you want to help minimize the busy work and you want to be able to save a little bit of time and have freedom to to connect with the important people in your life or to put more time and effort and energy into doing things that are going to actually grow your business, learning how to automate some of that busy work or delegate some of that busy work, but particularly with, with regards to our business, um, is really, really important. And uh, we, can't, we can't stress that enough. So thanks for bringing those up, Allie. Let me go to the next question, though. And, and this is a favorite of mine. I, I will admit that I'm guilty of buying lots of books and not necessarily always reading them, or at least right away. Uh, but I'm curious what one of the most impactful books uh, has been that you've read, whether it's been you know, a self-help book or a business book or otherwise. I'll give you two. I'll give you the, a business book and then one that's kind of personal, but also kind of gets into professional a little bit in a, in a backward way. So this the first one's kind of probably cliche, but The E-Myth was the first book that I ever read that was related to running your own business, entrepreneurship. Yeah, And I really loved that one just for breaking down the different kind of personalities of a business business owner, the entrepreneur of a business, the entrepreneur, the technician, the manager, and realizing that, you know, you can't necessarily be all those things and run a smooth business at all times. So um, that's been really interesting for me to kind of revisit from time to time. And then a recent book that I actually just read late last year, kind of early this year that has changed my personal life and started to change my business life is called The Zero Waste Home. And I know that sounds like it has nothing to do with professional life, but basically it's a book by a woman named Bea Johnson and she has managed to get her trash output down to essentially the size of a Mason jar every year. And it talks a lot about how, you know, like we, as, as people, as Americans, especially, we are just throwing so much away and wasting so many resources and not necessarily being conscious about what we're doing to our planet. And so I started to make huge changes in my personal life first and then my business life. So in my personal life, we've actually gotten to a point where 
we have, we shouldn't have to take the trash to the curb until like the end of the year based on where we're at. Like we haven't even filled a personal garbage bag all year in in our kitchen. Yeah. It's so it's really gratifying. I realized basically, I realized that I was now aligning my values with my actions more. And it kind of made me step back and say, okay, where else can I align my values with my actions? And that kind of went into business. And then also taking the waste thing into business, I realized, you know, I really stopped and thought, why am I, why would I send a gift to a client? What does this really mean? Am I going to send this box and it's going to come with all this little shredded paper that they're probably going to put in the trash? And then maybe it has a mug and they don't really need a mug and something else in it that's just stuff. And so I really started to look at how in my business I could be less wasteful and more environmentally friendly. And the the funny thing is, maybe not so funny, I started talking a lot about this just like on Instagram and through my through my clients and so forth. And so many of them are so excited about it and they're so on board with it and they're doing stuff personally too. And so I realized that we as small business owners, we don't really think about our environmental impact and, you know, the whole like community social responsibility that a lot of businesses focus on, big businesses focus on. So I've really been thinking about how I can do that as a small business owner. And it's changed my perspective a lot. It's just been really empowering to align my values with my actions. Uh, this is uh, again a loaded topic in and of itself, but I'm curious. Do you do you find? I mean, the idea first of all that you haven't taken your trash out yet this year is is an amazing, amazing concept. And and I could get lost thinking about how in the world I would function in order to be <laughs> able to do the same thing. But do you find that the amount of time that you have to invest in that lifestyle is is crippling? I mean, I, I would assume not. You seem very happy with it, but what does that actually look like? It's so funny. That's the first question that everybody asks me. And I think that early on, it was a little bit, I wouldn't say crippling. It was a little bit overwhelming just trying to get everything aligned. But now it's actually, it's actually really pretty simple. And I I turned to my husband the other day and I was like, I thought that we would do this as an experiment and see how long it would go and just kind of see what happened. But I actually feel like it's so easy. Why doesn't everybody do it? It's not, it's not that every bit of it is easy. And some of it, I mean, this would be like a whole other conversation and you can definitely read the book if you're interested. But I think in a lot of ways, it's actually been really good for our family because there are some extra things that we might do. Like if, I mean, I can buy, let's say for example, cookies at the store, just bring my own bag and put them in there. So I don't have to make everything from home. But I found that like with our kids, they really like doing that. Like it's been really fun for the family to kind of see what we can do, see what we can make, see how we can push that experiment further and further. Wow. Okay. Well, we'll we'll definitely link to the book in the show notes. You also <laughs> men- mentioned E-Myth and I personally read E-Myth Revisited some time ago, or at least a good chunk of the book. And it was, it was quite eye-opening. You talked about how you know, ultimately, if we want to run a what the word that comes to mind is sustainable business, uh, the idea of delegating. So again, so that you don't have to do it all yourself is really important. Uh, Scalable business is another phrase that comes to mind as well. If we want to actually build a business that is going to go for the long haul, and we don't want to get burnt out in the process, and we actually want to make a, you know, a halfway decent living as well, then the principles innate to, to this book are really, really important. So we'll make sure to link to that book in the show notes as well. By the way, for those of you listening in, make sure you check out the show notes, Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com, something that Haley has actually begun doing. Haley produces the podcast for us, does the editing and the show notes and so forth. And she's starting to, to put timestamps in the show notes as well. So if you're like, you know what, I want to jump to this particular section or this particular topic, you can. And I'll go ahead and add this as just a, a little bit of housekeeping side note. Ali, thanks for bearing with me. Um, I we, we get some really wonderful reviews from uh, from those who are listening in, and you can leave reviews, of course, if you go to the podcast uh, app on your phone in particular. You can also leave reviews on, on other apps on, on both Android and iOS. And we've gotten such a wide variety of comments and positive reviews. But somebody, actually, we've had a couple of people that have mentioned that we don't necessarily get to the primary topic quickly enough, or that our topics are wide ranging. You know, we'll put a we'll put a title with the show, and then we end up as, as those of you who are listening and are already aware of. We kind of cover a variety of topics <laughs> to get the, before we actually get to the primary topic. That is purposeful, and and I do it for the sake of variety, and I want to make sure that you're able to walk away with a wide variety of value adds, hopefully. 
but I, we are cognizant of this feedback and uh, I'm going to continue to work and kind of dialing in the format of the show and maybe giving at least a little bit more time to the primary topic. So you feel like you walked away with something of value from that as well. But I just wanted to, to at least acknowledge it and uh, kind of let you know what we're thinking about, about the format of the show. But let's keep moving, Ali. And uh, I'm curious, and you mentioned that you're in, in Michigan, you're a wedding and portrait photographer, in addition to, of course, uh, running this podcast, Photo Field Notes. But uh, you are, I mean, you've been in business how long at this point? I officially opened my business in 2010. Okay. So we'll say nine years at this point, which is quite a bit of time. And by the way, kudos to you for even making a business last that long. That is not something that everybody can can claim. But uh, what is one of the most significant, I guess, lessons that you've learned through the process of being a business owner? Like if you had 15 seconds in an elevator to share that lesson with a fellow photographer, what would that be? The advice that I usually give is avoid debt if you can in your in your business for a photography business, you know, you don't necessarily have to go into a lot of debt for your personal life, try to avoid or pay off your debt, make that a priority budgeting and just focusing some time on the business side because this is this is kind of a known thing. A lot of photographers are really good at the creative side and they don't put enough time into the business side. So mm. I think one of the things that I can attribute my success to as a business owner is that I care about the numbers and I care about the business side. And and really, if we're going to, as, as I was alluding to earlier, have a sustainable business, you just have to pay attention to it. The cool thing is with the tools that we have these days, I mean, I think again about QuickBooks Online, uh, this is a tool that many of you listening and probably are aware of. When I first started using QuickBooks 15 to you know 20 years ago or so, 15, 16, 17 years ago, um, it was a whole different beast of a piece of software that you had to you know actually buy the software at the store, order it online, and you get a CD and you plug it in, and then and it wasn't user friendly, and you really definitely needed a, an account to kind of help you get set up. It is so user friendly now. It's a minimal fee each month. You can keep up with your mileage and your expenses and ultimately enter the numbers there so that you're not only you don't only have them prepared for the sake of taxes, which is in and of itself quite helpful, but you're also aware of the numbers, where the expenses are, what your revenue looks like and what changes you might need to make in order to continue to build that successful business again for the long haul. So, yeah, awareness of numbers and that really can't be stressed enough. Would you do you personally use QuickBooks or what software do you use to keep up with those numbers? Gosh. Okay. So I've used just about everything. Okay. Funny enough, it's kind of actually embarrassing. I currently use 17 hats, even though it's the system is is not nearly as good as most. But I do my bookkeeping myself. It's fairly straightforward and I have a really good accountant. So even though it doesn't even have a balance sheet, I have to just kind of like plug that in myself. But my accountant makes everything you know, beautiful and done at the end. So I do use 17 has to keep it simple, but I don't necessarily think it's the best solution. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. But, but you mentioned an accountant too, and, and really the, the value of an accountant also can't be stressed enough. And, and as much as that might seem like ba basic advice to some of you listening in, um, there are enough photographers out there that still aren't putting enough priority on, on proactively maintaining their finances and ultimately improving their finances, particularly when it comes to their business and having an accountant who's got your back, who can help you out, who can educate you and take care of you is really, really important. So that's a good reminder as well. You're a wedding and portrait photographer, as I just alluded to, and there are many wedding and portrait photographers, certainly nationwide, even in Michigan. What is the thing that sets your business apart? For example, if somebody were to hear Ali Ciarto and, and your photography business what would come to their mind when they think about you? The first thing that you see when you come to my website and something that you see all over my social media pages is products. So that's a main thing that I think really sets me apart because I make a point to help people through the whole process be from, you know, teaching them how to style products in their home. Also just like helping them through the general process of everything, but getting products in their hands, helping them get products that fit in their homes, not just pushing anything, but really kind of like making sure it's, it, it's what fits for them. So that's the main thing. And then with that is just being helpful all the way through. So I get emails from people who say, oh, you're so much more helpful and so much more organized than any photographer I've ever worked with. This is such a relief. I love your systems. I love your invoicing. Just simple things like that, using the right tools to make that experience just a really joyful, stress-free experience and helping clients know what to expect, prep for their session, know what comes after without any questions along the way, or you're answering their questions along the way. 
And you know, that, that tendency toward organization, is this something that you developed over time? Because I, I have a similar tendency, but it's a lot of that comes from having taken the time to think through personally, to think through why I do what I do. And then of course, ultimately put systems in place that reflect the, the, I guess the innate philosophy um, to my life. And I'm just curious, is there, is there something that has enabled you to be more organized that might help our listeners be more organized as well? Well, it's definitely been a process. And I think that the main thing that you can do is every single time that you have something happen with a client where your client asks a question or your, or something goes wrong, write that down and work that into your workflow later. So if they come up where, if they come to your session and they're wearing something that just does not work, like let's say you end up, this happened to me. I ended up Photoshopping these, this shirt on a client because it was so clingy and it just did not fall very nicely. And I spent a ton of time Photoshopping it. And so what I realized was I needed to help them know what to wear and what not to wear. And so I worked that into a style guide that I send them and I got a, um, a system style and select.com where you can actually just have them take a quiz and it will style them for them. So every time I make a mistake, that makes my process better because I learn from it and I find a way to make that improve the information that I'm giving them. Oh, that's, that's really, really great. And you know, I, I wish I could remember right the second I saw this really great quote or heard the great quote yesterday or day before yesterday about the significance of learning it. You know, it's one thing we don't want to dwell on our past, but there is a wonderful benefit to having various experiences where we can learn from them. If we learn from them and apply those lessons moving forward, then ultimately we can benefit significantly. Even if we felt like we, we kind of screwed up, we made a mistake, there's an opportunity to be able to learn. It's also important. I mean, you, you mentioned communicating with your client or your interaction with your clients. It's important to, to be open to feedback from our clients or even potential clients, because there might be opportunity to improve what we're doing in our service to make it easier for them. And ultimately, of course, to benefit our business in the long run. I, let's, let's switch gears here just a little bit. And, uh, I, and what is the most unusual piece of gear or even just item in general that is in your camera bag that enables you to be a better photographer? <laughs> okay, so I've actually simplified my camera bag quite a lot because I found that a lot of stuff, and I still have, I have some stuff in there that I certainly don't use anymore, but I found that a lot of it I wasn't using. And when I was pregnant, I was like lugging my bag around and I was like, this has got to end. So although first I got a roller bag and then I kind of started simplifying. So really, if I go out on a session, I'm only taking three things with me. I'm taking a reflector and that one's unusual for a couple reason. So basically it's not, it's not, it's not actually unusual. It's a reflector <laughs> <laughs> only in that I use it for multiple things. So my reflector, I can use it as like a traditional reflector. I can use it to block the sun from my camera. So I don't get camera flare yeah. and then I can take the bag off of it. And when they have to sit on something that might be a little bit wet, I use that bag all the time. as just something they can sit on. So the reflector and it like holds my little stool. Like I have a little fold out stool just to make me a little bit taller. So it's just like my little package, my reflector. Those, is that one of those reflectors that, that folds up into a nice little, whether it's a sphere or a square or whatever it might be, that's really easy yeah. to transfer everywhere? Yeah, it's like a little circle. So it just folds down. I put it in a bag and I use it for everything. And then I just bring, when I'm on a session, I really only use my camera with my 85 millimeter lens. And I found that that's what I like. That's my favorite portrait lens. And so generally I might bring my bag with my other stuff just in case, but that's like, I don't think I've pulled out another lens in the last two years at a portrait session. So I pretty much just bring my reflector, my step stool and that camera. And then of course, you know, weddings, I've tried everything. I could tell you, I have like tried every single kind of diffuser and item that you can possibly get your hands on. And I, <laughs> I've gotten rid of a lot of those things, but generally I've learned that I'm an, I say that I'm an aspiring minimalist in my life and with everything. And so I'm trying to apply that in every place, you know, in my business with automation and my personal life, getting rid of things. And also when it comes to my gear and what I really need, because everything I bring, I have to lug around with me. Yeah, it's interesting that um, you point out just the simple practicality of if we add a ton of equipment to our bags, it is going to make our day, especially as wedding photographers. I mean, you shoot a 10, 12, 14 hour day as, as I've done, who knows how many times in the past, um, carrying around tons and tons of gear is just making it that much more complicated. I love a minimalist approach to life. It is something that I subscribe to as well. And even to gear, I can carry, literally, I can carry my business in a 
backpack that will slide under the seat in front of me on an airplane. And I love that. I, I like that I've been able to narrow it down, but there's just less moving parts to keep up with. And yeah. I, I think it helps us kind of clear our minds a little bit when we don't have to keep up with so much. But I'm curious, though, with that 85 millimeter lens, uh, do you find that you have to do a lot more work to, to scoop back in order to get a shot? <laughs> I do a lot of, hey, hang on just a minute. I'm just backing up. I know I look like I'm really far away, but <laughs> it's a long lens. So I, my advice on that, because I do love that lens. My advice is always for any photographer in any situation, don't stop talking. Because the second that you become silent mm. or like when you become silent for too long, they immediately are going to feel more awkward unless you give, I do a lot of prompts. Well, that helps too. I do a lot of prompts. So I have them talking to each other and laughing with each other. And that gives me an opportunity to back up without them realizing it, without it being awkward. But if I am talking to them and telling them what to do, I try to just have constant communication. Okay, I'm going to come in and get some closer photos. All right, I'm just going to back up here. I just have to run back for a quick second. Okay, I'm coming back. But between prompts and just constant communication, it's not hard. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about the, the significance of communication here on the podcast multiple times at this point. But the, the thing that always comes back to my mind is I think about photographers in a workshop environment. I know it's it's a bit unique, the workshop environment, when you're you're there with other photographers who are also photographing a model. But the thing that stands out to me that you see so consistently is that photographers go quiet. And so you have this model, even somebody who may be experienced being in front of the camera, this model standing there, you know, maybe it's a couple standing there and not getting feedback or instruction or direction from the person or the people with the camera. And it, it really doesn't encourage a, first of all, great environment, especially for those who aren't comfortable in front of the camera, that silence. They're like, what, what's going on? What am I supposed to do? Where do I put my hands? How do I stand? Am I making a weird face? And it ultimately makes what could be a positive experience for that client one that is uncomfortable. And that's not going to be a great reflection on your brand. So the importance of consistently communicating with that person or those people in front of your camera, I, my favorite thing to do is to compliment and you know, find something that you can genuinely compliment about the way that they're, the, the expression that they're making, the clothes that they're wearing, something that they're doing and, and encourage them through that process. I think it's really important. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's move on to what is going to be our primary focus of conversation today. And and you mentioned products earlier, Ali. This is a plays a significant role in your business. But uh, what's particularly interesting to me about the way that you sell products is that you very specifically are doing so without IPS, without trying to sell products in person. And you know, so much of what we talk about, as I alluded to earlier here on, on Boca, is about freedom, right? Creating freedom for ourselves as photography business owners. And if there is a way to go about selling more product, something, honestly, I didn't put enough emphasis on as a photographer when I was shooting weddings. Uh, if there's a way to sell more product without the, the time necessary to conduct these in-person meetings, I'm certainly curious about what that looks like. So we're <laughs> going to get into that today because I want to share your workflow with our listeners. But what does your photography business look like before implementing this workflow? Well, it started because I was like everybody else originally. I was just sending originally, you know, DVDs and then I was just sending the galleries and that was it. And it was really easy because I would just send it anytime and I would cross it off my list and it was done. And then I went to a client's home. I had photographed their wedding and I was taking maternity photos and she had one little tiny print from her wedding. And I think she was a little bit embarrassed because I was there and there weren't many. And it's not that I was in there like, where are my photos? <laughs> but she noticed it and she turned to me and she was like, we loved our wedding photos so much, but we were so overwhelmed. We didn't know what to do with them. So we just ended up printing this little four by six to put by our bed. And that was it. We just we didn't know what to do. It's, hmm. it's too much work. And I realized it was kind of a light bulb moment where I realized, oh, I can help them. It can be my job to help them from beginning to the end. I'm just assuming because I know what to do with my photos that everybody knows. That's like assuming, you know, Nobody needs an interior designer. Nobody needs any help with anything. We're not all DIY people. So I started, I actually first started with in-person sales. So I started, I shared a studio that I would do all of my in-person sales meetings like every Thursday and I would be there all day long and I would do all these in-person sales. And every single time I did it, I was like, oh, whoa, people do want prints. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. And so I definitely realized the benefits of prints. 
But at the time I was pregnant and I, let's see, I think I was like up to seven, eight months pregnant and in the studio. And I realized, okay, I have it at the time, a two, not even two year old at home. I'm pregnant. I'm tired. <laughs> I don't want to get, I, it was a, I think a 15 minute drive to the studio. And I just felt like I was there all the time. And so I was like, there's gotta be a way that I can take these concepts and make them more automated like I like to do. And so I decided to give it a try and see what would happen. And the very, I think the very first time that I did it automated was like Halloween or right around Halloween. So obviously I wasn't going to do a meeting that night. I was trick or treating and I got something like a thousand dollar sale. Oh, while we wow. Were trick or treating. Yeah. And then I did another one where it's always, it's always funny. Cause I feel like all these like early on great sales, I was always doing something way more fun than meeting somebody. So a friend asked me if I wanted to go to like this trampoline warrior ninja workout class thing. And at that class I made like something like $1,400. I, I came out to my car and I had a little email alert that was like, you made $1,400. And then I think another one, I went to book club and I made like $2,000. And I was like, yeah, this is working. <laughs> this, there's something to this. So I, so that's what I've been doing. I do an online, basically online sales, but I kind of mimic some of the concepts that I learned from in-person sales. And, and it, honestly, the, the reason that I avoided getting into certainly in-person sales and even some of the automation, a lot of the automation that uh, I know that you're going to share more details of here in just a second. When I was a photographer, I just didn't want to, to take the time. Uh, and honestly, I guess in some ways it was probably laziness on my part at that point. But we were using a, a service, a company called Pictage. And Pictage, with your online galleries, they would actually do a little bit of promotional work or marketing work for you. They'd send emails out to the client. And sometimes we would get, well, in fact, not even sometimes, a lot of times we would get print sales that we didn't really have to do any work for. We were charging a premium up front. And, and our thought process was we just charge a premium up front. We'll make our money there. Print sales would be gravy. But the reality, I'm, I'm realizing certainly now, especially after conversations about IPS, and, and uh, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about doing this without IPS, is that we left a lot more money on the table that we could have made just by approaching it in a more intelligent and more efficient way. What, what are the tangible benefits? And this is almost maybe an obvious question to ask, but what are the, some of the tangible benefits to your life and business with this approach to selling products? Money is obviously one. And I do think to answer your money question, I do think in-person sales, you're probably going to have uh, more consistent, slightly higher sales just because you are investing that time to sit down with them. But when you look at hour for hour, I think that I make more money doing this process because I don't have that long meeting, sometimes very long meetings where I would spend my entire evening to get the sale. So when you take out all that extra time between the automation that I use to book the session, the information that I send them to prep them for it, the amount of work that I'm doing is actually not that much. So in the end, when you look at it hour for hour, I think it's more money overall, but it is less typically per client. Although weddings, I think can be, can kind of be a different factor there because weddings, you're spending more time with them over a long time. So weddings, I do still tend to get pretty big sales with them. So money definitely. And then just the other benefit is that clients are happier because they're getting these tangible products at the end of the day. And so I get notes and I always have them send me a photo. I don't actually hang the photos for them. I know some photographers do that. I just say, Hey, when you get these on your wall, I would love for you to send me a picture of what it looks like. And they always send me this picture and they're so excited. And they always, with that, it's kind of maybe selfish. A, I use it for marketing because then I can show my, what the design that I did and then the final photo of what it looks like. And then every time they send that photo, they always send a gushing note that tells me, okay, this is, this is really adding value to their lives. They'll say, I, you know, I have this frame set in a really a place in my home where I see it every day and I look at it and I smile and sometimes I catch myself just stopping and staring and not moving because I'm looking at it for so long and they're just they're so excited about it. And then obviously automating it instead of meeting we kind of already talked about that is a huge time savings 
So it's not fully automated because you do still have to kind of set everything up. But generally, you can, well, we'll get into the details of how it works, but it's a lot more automated than in person sales. Yeah, which is nice. I mean, again, at the end of the day, if we started a business to, to sit in front of the computer 80 hours a week, we can very easily do that, right? But I think mm-hmm. approaching our business intelligently and being proactive in an effort to create efficient workflow that gives us more time is really important. So I, I love that we're talking about this today. You mentioned the significance of the amount of time it requires to do in-person sales and how that needs really ultimately to be con- kind of figured into the equation, right? I mean, if you're, if you're going into an in-person sales session and it takes you three or four hours and you walk away with three grand, that's great, but it still took the three or four hours. Uh, whereas maybe if you're able to, to sell this product automatically through this workflow you're about to share and you may walk away with 1500 bucks, but you do it with, you know, half hours work, um, that equation has to be considered. How much time did it require in order to make that amount of money? And I know that everyone's priority when it comes to time is going to look maybe slightly different, but I'm all for being able to figure out ways to automate my business so that I can, for me, really the biggest priority is spending time with important people in my life. And that, I just don't think that can be stressed enough. I know, I know it's important to you, Ali, you've got family and a beautiful one at that, but the, the reality is that if we put too much time into our business, while we may be making a little bit extra cash, we're missing out on an opportunity to further our relationship with the important people in our life. I'm for yeah. automation and efficiency and ultimately taking advantage of systems that enable us to make money while simultaneously um, saving time. So let's talk really specifically, I guess, on a, on a very practical level about what this workflow looks like. Will you share what those steps are with our listeners? Yeah. Okay. I break it down into four kind of steps, like a four step process. So number one, you have to start by curating your products. And we always think a lot of us think this is also okay. Remember how I said I'm an aspiring minimalist. This same concept comes into our products. We think more is better, but actually less is better. So you need to have just a set a set of products that you absolutely love that are going to fulfill the needs without overwhelming. And so I was totally guilty of saying, Oh, I love this product. And I love this product. And I love this product. I should just offer everything. But I realized that if I was offering everything, people were completely overwhelmed and they would actually buy less. And so if you're offering them fewer products, they are going to be more likely to buy. One quick story example in my own personal life, we were building, we wanted to build a desk for our office. So my husband works from home. And so we basically sit side by side in this big office. And I went to a guy who builds, who does beautiful woodworking work. And I wanted him to build us this like built-in desk that was going to be the whole length of the, the wall that we work on. And I kind of sketched my horrible design of what it would look like. And then he took it and he drew up a really beautiful design. And then he said, okay, what kind of wood do you want it to be? And I was like, uh, like the wood kind. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're the expert. I want yeah. you to tell me what kind of wood I want it to be. And it kind of, it kind of fell off because he never answered my question. I never ended up buying the desk because huh. if he had said, okay, I think you should for your space, I think you should choose either this type of wood or this type of wood. And he gave me either two options or honestly, if he just gave me one option, I probably would have picked that because I would have said, oh, he's the expert. And he just told me that I should choose this option. Mm. And he knows that's going to look good in the space. So that's what I'm going to choose. So not offering your clients everything, not being general like that, where you're just like, oh, pick everything. So really being specific about what you what you offer, curate your products. So that's step one. That's good. And, and, you know, I mean, you, you speak to the, the, I guess the expertise that should be innate to our selling product or selling process, rather understanding why we're offering what we're offering, being specific, understanding just the, the psychology and sales, which is less is potentially more. You have, you know, that, that paradox, that so-called paradox of choice. Uh, I wrote, read a fascinating book actually about this very concept a little while back. Um, yeah. And and the significant stress that we experience in modern culture from so many options. Uh, the reality is that we can actually make our clients' lives easier if we minimize those options, but then understand why we're offering those particular options and be able to communicate that effectively to our client is really important. But curating our products, less is more. That's a great, great uh, idea for all of us to keep in mind. What's the next one? Okay. The next one is setting client expectations. So from the very minute that they come to my website, they see the first thing that they see is products. So they see a a picture of different products and then they see a 
link to a blog post that basically says, here's how I display my photos in my home. So here's inspiration. So I'm walking them through photos of my home. And I have, of course, huge prints everywhere and albums and different things. And if you can't afford at this point to put huge frames on your walls, then pick one little place and put up something small where you can at least focus on that and talk about how much it means to you. Because if you're not putting anything in your own home, then you're not really communicating to your clients that you care about this stuff. It just looks like you're not being genuine. So I genuinely care about this. It's all over my website. It's on my social media. It's in my client communications. Even in my contact form, I ask them, how do you see yourself looking back at your photos in 10 years? And I have a checklist that they can choose from. So I'm kind of prompting them like, hint, hint, these are your options. And then they check and tell. And so then that creates that conversation where we can talk about what they're interested in. So setting expectations all from the very beginning and all the way through. That's number two. Well, and, and I have to give you props too, because I, and I'm actually on your homepage, uh, the homepage of your, your site right now. And by the way, for those of you listening, and we'll link to these in the show notes, but Ali's photography website is Ali Ciarto. Just, uh, well, I say just like it sounds, I'll spell it out. A-L-L-I-E-S-I-A-R-T-O.com. And it's going to be uh, actually the same thing on Instagram. We'll link to those in the show notes. And then we'll talk about photo field notes here in just a little bit. But I, when you go to your your website, you know, so many photographers, it's just a, a pretty picture or two or five, um, whether they're wedding photographers or portrait photographers, you see samples of their work. It's so unusual to actually go to a homepage of a photographer's site and see products immediately. And then you reference these blog posts. I'm, I'm looking at the scrolling imagery here on the homepage um, that says how to style your home with photos is one of them. The next one says, see how we display our photos. And you do, you, you've got a, a blog post that says how to style your home with photos and kind of a, a walkthrough of your, by the way, extremely beautiful, a very minimalist feeling home and, <laughs> and demonstrating that for your clients. And you're right. If you're going to sell, if you're going to say, hey, that's important to have prints and you're not actually living that out yourself, um, I, that's, that's probably going to come out in some way, right? And so being consistent with these values that we're trying to kind of project on our clients, uh, I think is really, really important. But I, I love the personalization of that, the personal element of saying, hey, here's what we do, here's what it looks like. And the focus, just in and of itself, the focus on your homepage of selling a product or on the products themselves helps you stand out, which uh, we, we talked about the idea of brand position, what makes you unique earlier. You truly exhibit that. And I really love that. Thanks. Yeah. And showing your own home really does personalize it. It kind of helps them to get to know you. It's that whole, you are your brand when you're a photographer. So I think that that's really helpful. All right. So that's two. So number three kind of ties in, give your clients the right tools. So a couple of things in terms of like giving them the right tools to make the sale. I have a whole email workflow that I use that I, that's kind of my toolkit is that I use 17 hats and I have everything pre pre basically written where I can just plug in little things in there and, and send those emails at the right times to get what I need. I have a style guide that I used to send in, I used to mail it and now I do it digitally. Part of that was just like my goal to cut back on trash and just like things. So now I send them a digital style guide and the style guide is kind of two parts. The first part of it is prepping them for the session. So it's talking about what to wear. It's talking about hints and tips and things that are going to make the session go more smoothly things for, you know, bringing a helper along if they have pets or if they have kids, how to make it work with kids, things like that. So that's the first part. The second part is just pure inspiration. So it's, it's just photos that show how you can then put your photos into your home. It's frames, it's different products. And it's not just like, Hey, here is an album. Isn't it pretty? It's like, here's an album styled onto a bookshelf where the album is the first layer. And then I have a little box on top of that. And then I have a little like succulent plant on top of that or whatever it is. It's showing them that I basically say, I think somewhere on my website, I say, I want it to feel like Joanna Gaines came into your home and styled this album. I want to give you the tools to make this look beautiful in your home instead of just have a thing that you're like, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> right. Well, and, and I mean, your, your home, if you're talking about Joanna Gaines and, and what we see on TV, it, your home is stunning. I mean, for those of you curious, you're going to have to make sure you click on this link on, on the, the homepage and just kind of scroll through and look at the way that Ali has not only beautifully designed the interior of her home, the interior decoration of her home, but also the way that those images are displayed. Um, but giving clients, I guess, possibilities, right? They may not realize what is possible and giving them very tangible examples through that style gate style guide makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah. So that's a big part of the planning process. I also, in the style guide, have some information about helping them choose a location. So that kind of gets that conversation going. And then the third tool that I use is Swift Galleries. And Swift Galleries is a tool that lets me, I have them send a photo of the wall, their wall or multiple walls. And that's also like, I also get to see their personal style because I'm seeing what the room looks like. And I can use that to choose the location and kind of help them with outfits. So we're looking at, okay, if you are thinking about putting this on this wall and this wall is this color, this is a location that would look good. These are the colors you could wear. So it's getting them thinking about that whole picture from the beginning. And it's that's kind of more automated because I'm not necessarily sitting down with them and having that meeting. The style guide is giving that information. So Swift Galleries, they send me a picture and they have they just tape a sheet of paper on the wall, like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And then I can use that paper to scale the size of the wall. And then I can put together design options for them. So they can actually see what their photos are going to look like on that wall to scale. And it's so fun. I love it. And then they actually get to like pick their images that way, see what it's going to look like. And what I love from a marketing perspective, like I said earlier, when my clients send me a photo of the final wall, I'll match that up with the design that I did in Swift Galleries and I'll share that online so that people can see the before and after. Um, And I just started finally putting those up on Instagram. So if you go to my Instagram at Ali Ciardo, I think I have... I think I have a highlights story or something called like wall design. I can't remember. Go check it out. I I just added the first one. So I'm starting to kind of like keep them in a place where they're all together. Yeah. And and again, we'll link to this in the show notes, but yeah, they're on your personal Instagram. It says wall design and and you can click through, uh, begin to click through some examples of what, what that might actually look like. And you mentioned Swift galleries. Uh, we'll link to this in the show notes as well. The, the URL is actually the printmaker system, but it looks like they've got a whole system in place there that, that enables or helps photographers sell product. Is that right? Oh yeah. They did just change it. Yeah. So their main focus is in-person sales, but the tool can also be shared online. So it's set up so that you can actually use it for a virtual sale too. Okay, very, very good. And, and again, the, the significance here of letting the client know what's possible, particularly visually, uh, I think is a really important concept that we need to, to keep in mind here. So this has been really good. You shared uh, the significance of curating products, kind of the minimalist approach, if you will, less is more, minimizing that paradox of choice, setting expectations and then giving clients the right tools. And again, the significance of a visual representation, communicating effectively what is possible, really, really important. Um, I think you've got one more tip. What is that? Yeah, one more. And before that, let me go back. When I, You just said something about how people can't visualize, and that's so true. I just want to highlight that really quickly because sure. my sister is a realtor. My dad's a realtor too. And But specifically when I was talking with my sister, she was saying that to me, you know, people can't, visualize when they walk into a home and it might need like a different colored wall, they can't, they might not buy the home because they can't visualize what that home is going to look like with a different color or with the wallpaper taken down. And so if you're a really visual person and you have that ability to visualize what something's going to look like, you might be taking it for granted. But a lot of people, when they walk into a room or when they're looking at trying to design something, they don't have that vision. And so they really do need to see it to understand it. So Point. We'll get we'll get into the fourth. Okay, so the fourth the fourth and final step in the process, which is very important, is to host. I kind of call it like a virtual viewing party, and so this is like when you have an in person sales meeting, you're actually picking a time and a place and you're getting together and you're meeting. Well, I'm not doing that. I'm not there. It's not actually a party that I'm attending, but I do have them choose time. So instead of me finishing my photos and sending them over whenever they're ready. I have them choose a time when they can be together and I have them block off a night. I say, choose a night when you're going to be or a day on a weekend when you're going to be together and you can dedicate that evening to sitting down and I'm going to send your photos that night through an email. So I basically pre-schedule the email. I just schedule it to go out. So I'm like, I don't care if it's Saturday morning at 7 a.m. I will schedule it to go over to you at that time. Yeah. And so that is the time that they are dedicated, that they are sitting down together. This is the most fascinating thing because I never really realized it. I thought, okay, if people are, let's say they have to be together and that's going to 
make them choose a later date. Oh, they could have seen the photos today. They're not going to want to wait. Well, I actually found I had some clients waiting two weeks because they weren't going to be able to be really together and focused and dedicated for two extra weeks. So they waited two extra weeks to see their photos because it meant that much for them to be together. So people want to be together. They get really excited. And every time I explain that, they go, oh, that makes so much sense. Of course, we would want to see these together. So virtual viewing party is the night that they see their photos. And that's also the night that they order their products. So on the night that they see their photos, that's the day that they're going to do any ordering that's going to happen. So it's a dedicated night. And I use videos to walk them through and emails and different language that kind of steps them through the process. But basically, that is the night, the dedicated night. That's the night that I get my email that says you've made your skill. So Having a virtual party is a huge part of it because it's putting a time limit on it. It's it's giving them that dedicated time. Now, a few questions or at least a couple of questions here that come to mind. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the scheduling of email. We've talked about Boomerang as a tool for those of you who are Gmail users as a tool that enables you to be able to schedule emails. Are you using Boomerang or what tool are you using to schedule the email that goes to them? It's also 17 Hats. 17 Hats just added the ability. I used to... I used to write the email. And then on the time I would hit send (laughs) whenever it was, (laughs) which was a pain. And 17 hats just recently added the ability to schedule your email. So that's what I use. And I know boomerang, you could use boomerang, but because I use 17 hats with my whole system where I pre-save all my email templates and I just pop in their custom information. And then I say schedule. Oh, it's scheduling emails is amazing. It's the best thing. It really is and for multiple reasons, right? We don't want to, as you pointed out, have to, to kind of keep an eye on our email and come back at a particular time. We don't want to be sending emails out at ridiculous hours of the day and, and create expectations that we're always in our email. And then uh, our clients begin to expect us to respond at all hours of the day. Uh, but being able to automate that process really makes our life, it frees our life up and it makes it more efficient, which is, is really, really good. But then you also talked about this virtual viewing party. And I'm curious if you're using a particular type of software for them to view the images in, or is it just being posted to a gallery, but they can, they can look at them. What does that process look like? I do. I use a slideshow software. So I use Pixaloo slides. What's it called? Slideshow. I can't remember exactly. Pixaloo. Um, and so they get to see everything as a slideshow first to music. So it's a much more emotional experience. It's kind of a sit back emotional experience for them. And then they do just get a link to their gallery. So in the email, it kind of links them to each place. I also do a video at the beginning where I walk them through it. So it's sort of like I'm there. I say, okay, basically like click here first and then here's my video. And I, I tell them what to expect and I set them up for everything. And then the email just kind of links them through. The next. So instead of being there in person to walk them through, I'm there virtually. So Pixel, you said Pixel Loop, like it's P I X E L L U. Oh, they Pixel also Loop. do, yeah, Pixel Loop. They also do album design, but they, but I don't use that. I just use their slideshows. It's a separate service. Let me make sure I'm giving you the right one. <laughs> sure. And, and either way, we'll link to this in the show notes as well. For those of you listening in, again, bocapodcast.com, the resources that we discussed today will be there. Uh, in the show notes, along with the timestamps to kind of break down our conversation at Pixaloo, you'd mentioned, is that correct? Yeah, it's pixaloo.com slash slash slide share. So it's Pixaloo slide share. Perfect. And then the last question, you mentioned that they make their purchases that same evening that they're looking at the images. So how do you create that, that parameter, if you will, the, the expectation number one, but then two, what tool are you using that kind of forces sounds too strong, but pushes them to place the order that evening. Yeah, there's, I just use pixie set for that. So it's just like any other um, online system. And there's two different ways to do it. One, you can just make it so that that's the only night that they can order sales and that the gallery is going to be gone. And that's that. Um, The other way is that you can incentivize them with a sale and basically base your pricing off of a sale so that they're going to get a discount when they make that purchase in that time frame right away. So that's a big incentive for them to make that to make that purchase and feel like they're getting a really good deal based on 15 percent off, 20 percent off. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Incentivization is, is uh, it could definitely be a powerful tool. And, and then it doesn't, it, it actually seems to them, to the client or the potential client, like a, a value add versus them being forced to make a decision in that particular instant. And uh, so that's, that's great piece of advice. This has been a really great conversation in general, Allie, and, and really probably just kind of scratches the surface of ultimately the value that 
that you have to be able to add to our industry. I mentioned earlier your podcast, Photo Field Notes, and we'll make sure to to actually link to Photo Field Notes in the show notes as well. Instagram is the same thing, Photo Field Notes, and we'll link to that in the show notes. This this is not the the only education that you offer to photographers. I mean, this is something you've been involved in for some time. Will you talk a little bit about the Photo Field Notes brand and, and the podcast a little more as well? Okay, so Photo Field Notes, the Photo Field Notes podcast is photofieldnotes.com and at Photo Field Notes. And I started, I actually started my very first podcast in 2006 before anybody knew what a podcast was. Wow. I did it as a college project. And I did that for years when I worked in public relations and it was kind of in the public relations area. And then stopped for a while. I was running a market research company for a while and I just didn't have time. But as I got into photography and more and more that became my full time, I actually ended up stopping with the market research and going full time with photography. And I just loved it so much. And conversations like this were just so enlightening to me. And I just like selfishly loved to connect with people and ask them questions at first. And then I realized that I actually had things to share myself and I started Mm. doing some solo episodes. And so podcasts have just been kind of a, a, just a favorite thing for me for so many years. So that's really been the inspiration. And then last year I partnered with Design Aglow to actually create a course about this whole virtual process. And so that's now available. You can see the link to that on photofieldnotes.com. You can also find it on designaglow.com. So it's virtual sales. Um, I think it's, I should know the name of it. Let's just go see. If you go to (laughs) photofieldnotes.com slash shop, you can see it. It is called... It says, right, is this the virtual product sales and style guide magazine template? That's it. Yeah. See, you're so on it, Nathan. So basically what that is, it's offered separate with a separate style guide, that style guide that I talked about. And then it also has a full course that goes with it that has the email workflow that I use, videos where I walk through every single step, every single step from the technical side to exactly what I say, exactly what I do. So that course came about basically because I was working with, I was doing a lot of design aglow. I was just obsessed with design aglow. So a lot of my products were already from there. And so I started talking with Lena who runs design aglow about, you know, what my process looked like and putting together a course around it. And so we launched that earlier this year and it's just been really exciting to see that people have been able to change their businesses based on this process and that they're having a lot of success doing it too. So I knew it worked, but it was really enlightening to hear that it was also working for other people <laughs> once we got that course out there. That's really great. Well, and and I, I like the, uh, first of all, you and I share a couple of things in common here with, with these podcasts. One, we both enjoy conversation. I'm continuing to learn how to be a better conversationalist, how to ask better questions. It's been a learning process and it certainly hasn't stopped yet. But then too, the, the opportunity to be able to add value to the industry and and I guess share what we've learned in addition to then, of course, being able to share what other photographers are learning through these conversations. I think it's really, really great. And especially when it comes to the workflow that we talked about earlier and more specifically the style guide, there's an opportunity here for our listeners to be able to learn more about that. So, of course, we'll link to the photo field notes, uh, the the podcast, and uh, you'll be able to jump into the shop there and see this style guide magazine template that we were referencing. And, of course, photo field notes. You're all going to want to follow photo field notes on Instagram, and it is just photo field notes. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. But thank you so much, Allie, for making time today, especially on Wednesday um, to (laughs) to hang out with us and to have conversation. And we'll really, really appreciate you sharing all that you've learned about this process. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com.